This is the 8th grade star science hacking video. And if you use all the strategies we talk about here, you're going to do awesome on the test. The first thing that we're going to annotate is this little element box right here. And we're going to remember back to ape man. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons and the number of electrons. And it's what gives the element its identity. So we're going to put A equals P equals E there. And the atomic mass is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if you're given any one of these pieces of information, you'll be able to use these formulas to find out. And the last one is uh, the man part of eight man and it's atomic mass minus atomic number equals the number of neutrons in the first three letters here spell out man. You are now able to answer a ton of questions about subatomic particles. The next part, we're going to move up to the valence electrons. And valence electrons help us determine the chemical properties of elements, including their react reactivity. So what we're going to do is draw some lines to these little numbers uh, on top of every group or family. And that's going to tell you the number of valence electrons in these groups. So you can see one, two, this one's going to have three valence electrons, four, and so on. We're going to move over to this blank space and talk about groups and families. Now, groups and families are all the elements within the same column, and a column goes up and down throughout the periodic table. So groups and families and the elements within them all have similar properties, meaning they have similar characteristics, but they also have the same number of valence electrons. So every element within the group has the same number of valence electrons. Therefore, they also have the same reactivity. If we look at group 16 here, all of the elements will have the same number of valence electrons and reactivity and similar, similar properties. We're going to turn our sheet and on the left hand side, we're going to talk about the rows of the periodic table. The rows are called periods. And the periods on a periodic table represent the number of energy levels or energy shells within a certain element or an atom of an element. For example, in period two, the element will have two energy levels. In period three, the element will have three energy levels. Now we're going to turn our paper back and look at the bottom of the periodic table and make some notes down here. We're going to talk about the subatomic particles. Those are the three main um, things that live within every atom. First, we have protons. They have a positive charge and they're found inside the nucleus of the atom. The next thing we have are neutrons. And they have no charge. So we're going to put a, a, a zero here because they have no charge. And they're also found inside the nucleus. Remember, if you add these up, you can get the atomic mass. Lastly, we have the electrons, which have very little mass, but they have a negative charge and they're found outside of the nucleus of an atom. The protons and neutrons make up the bulk of the mass of an atom. So when you add those together, you'll get the atomic mass. And then the electrons have very little mass at all. The next thing we're going to do is use this bottom right hand space to write out the compound for glucose, which is C6H12O6. And we're going to first count the number of elements in this compound. We'll just underline those. So how many are there? There are three elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. You can also figure out looking at this compound, how the number of atoms. So we're going to circle the subscripts, add them all up, and you'll find out that there are 24 atoms in this particular compound. The last thing we're going to do on the front of this page is talk about chemical reactions. A chemical reaction has occurred whenever a new substance is formed and it can't be changed back to the original substance. There are several pieces of evidence that we look for to determine if a chemical reaction or a chemical change has happened. One of them is an unexpected color change. If you have a color change 
happen when you mix two solutions that you weren't expecting, it's likely a chemical reaction occurred. An unexpected temperature change is another piece of evidence. Mix two solutions, the temperature changes, and that is likely a chemical reaction occurring. New substance has been formed. The third one we're gonna talk about is a precipitate. If you've mixed two liquid solutions together and it forms, a, a solid forms within the liquid, either suspended or at the bottom, that is an evidence of a chemical reaction. Fourth, bubbles or fizzing. If a gas is being produced, that is a piece of evidence for a chemical reaction. And then lastly, if you have smoke, fire, or burning, you can assume that a chemical reaction or chemical, chemical change has taken place. Next, we're gonna flip our paper over and work with the formula chart on the back. We're gonna draw three formula triangles. Uh, density equals mass divided by volume. Average speed equals total distance divided by total time and net force equals mass times acceleration. And you'll be able to use these triangles for any problem that you get uh, when they give you two of the variables already. For this third one here, this is also Newton's second law or the formula for Newton's second law. And to solve, for example, on density, if we wanted to solve for density, it's mass divided by volume. If we wanted to solve for mass, it's density multiplied by volume. If we wanted to solve by vo for volume, it would be mass divided by density. Next, we're gonna draw two lines to create four different areas to work with. All right, in the upper left-hand quadrant, you're going to be drawing a lunar cycle diagram. So we're gonna start by drawing the sun on the right-hand side, and then we'll draw a model of the earth in the middle here. And then we're gonna draw the eight moon potential moon phases around the Earth. I like to draw uh, these four first and then fill in the other four. It makes it a little easier and a little bit more balanced. So we'll just fill in these last four and that way we have it kind of just more balanced. Okay, we're gonna start when the moon is between the Earth and the sun. You do not see it in the sky. Um, and that is called the new moon. And we're gonna work our way around counterclockwise and draw out all the different moon phases. This is going to have, the light is gonna start on the right and this is a waxing crescent. And the light is gonna be getting bigger from the right hand side of the moon as we work towards the full moon. This moon phase is called the first quarter Half of the moon on the right is lit up. We're still waxing here, meaning the light is getting bigger. This is called the waxing gibbous. And then finally, when the earth is between the moon and the sun, this is a full moon and we see the full uh, reflection of the sun on the moon. Now the light is gonna start getting smaller on the left-hand side. This is called a waning gibbous. As the light decreases, we're now into the third quarter or also called the last quarter. And then lastly, when we have just a sliver of light on the left-hand side, it is going to be called the waning crescent. So waxing is when the light is getting bigger on the right and waning is when the light is getting smaller on the left. Now you're gonna need to know the timing between each of these phases. So between the new moon and the waxing crescent is about three and a half days. You're gonna be able to, you're gonna have to predict it. So between the new moon and the first quarter, it's about one week or seven days. The new moon and the full moon is about two weeks and the new moon all the way back around to the third quarter is about three weeks. And the new moon all the way back around to the new moon again is about 28 days. Roughly 28 days. Not quite a month. 
So between each moon phase, major moon phase is about three and a half days. And then it's a week between um, new and first and so forth. Okay, now we're going to look at the tides. We're going to draw a straight line through the from the sun, through the new moon, earth and full moon. And this is called a spring tide. One easy way to remember this is a S in spring. And there's also an S in the word straight. So spring and straight means the sun, earth and moon are, are lined up in a straight line. And this will produce the highest high tides and lowest low tides. Highest, the dif biggest difference between the tides. This, when we draw the line in the sun, earth, and moon in perpendicular to each other, this is called a neap tide. An easy way to remember this is the in and neap is also the same as in in the 90 degree angle. You can see the angle here. The sun, earth, and moon creates a 90 degree angle between the sun, earth, and moon. And I'll just draw the angle here. That's the 90 degrees. So that's called a neap tide. We're going to now move into the top right quadrant where we're going to be working with a seasons diagram. So you can answer any questions about seasons. We'll draw the sun in the middle and then four different earths around the sun to represent each of the four seasons. We want to be sure that we put the equator on all of the earths and that we have it at a tilt. So we need to have the axis, which is the reason that we have seasons is because the earth is tilted. That's the reason we have seasons. And so we're going to start with the Northern hemisphere when it's pointed towards the sun or it's tilted toward the sun. That will be summer in the Northern hemisphere, winter in the Southern hemisphere. After summer comes fall. So we'll work our way around uh, when the Northern hemisphere is pointed away from the sun or tilted away from the sun, you'll have winter in the North. And then after winter comes spring and it will just repeat the cycle. Now that it, knowing that is great, but you also need to know that in the summer we have long daylight hours and short uh, night hours. So we're going to write that on our star hack. In the winter, we have short daylight hours and long nighttime hours. And it will be opposite in the southern hemisphere. Right now, we're just looking at the northern hemisphere. In the bottom left quadrant, we're going to talk about plate boundaries or plate tectonics. There are several different types of plate boundaries. The first one we're going to talk about is convergent boundaries. And convergent boundaries are when two plates collide together and they create mountains. Generally, when two continental plates collide together, they create a mountain chain. Now, they can also, if one is more dense than the other, they create a subduction zone. Generally, what happens is it, an oceanic plate goes underneath a continental plate, and it creates trenches, and the geological formation that is created on the backside of the continental plate is a volcano. Next, we have plates that are going apart from each other are diverging. Those are called divergent, or that's called a divergent plate boundary. And on when two continental plates diverge, they create rift valleys. And when two oceanic plates diverge, they create mid ocean ridges. And then lastly, if plates are sliding by each other, these are called transform plate boundaries. And these plate boundaries, when they slide past each other, create earthquakes. Lastly, we're going to talk about some life sciences in this bottom right-hand corner and just uh, help you to remember some common terms. Biotic and abiotic. Biotic means living. Abiotic means non-living. The A means non. So if you see that. And then we're going to look at the words prokaryotic. Prokaryotic cells have no nucleus in them. And then eukaryotic cells, EU, karyotic cells, 
are cells with a nucleus that has DNA inside. And the way you remember this is pro no, and then you, you, because you have eukaryote, you're made up of eukaryotic cells. And then we have autotrophs, which make their own food like plants. And heterotrophs, which hunt for their own food. And the way I like to remember this is the H in heterotroph is also this, the H in hunt. And then the last two terms we'll look at are sexual and asexual. Sexual is two parents who have offspring with different DNA. Or another way to say this is diverse offspring. They're different. And then asexual reproduction has only one parent, but it has identical offspring or uniform offspring. Same DNA as the parent. All right, there you have it. Star hack. It is ready to go and you are going to do amazing on this test. Can't wait to hear about it.